basically the main message from that report was that the costs and risks associated with inaction, with not doing very much, with business as usual, are far greater than the costs and risks associated with action. And I think that message is even stronger now than it was before. Stronger because we haven't moved anything like uh, fast enough. Uh, emissions are going on rising quite strongly. Uh, the science, uh, as we've seen in the recent uh, report of the IPCC Working Group 1 on the science, indicates to us that uh, the risks look perhaps even bigger uh, than before because emissions have gone on rising and because some of the things that are left out of the science models, like uh, the thawing of the permafrost, look even more worrying than they did before. So um, I think that that statement that the costs and risks of inaction are far greater than the costs of risks, risks, costs and risks of action is stronger. Actually, in addition, stronger because technology has moved reasonably fast over the last six years, as well as the risks looking even bigger of inaction. The uh, UK's um, climate change minister, Greg Barker, said earlier today he felt it was politically um, easier these days to be able to sell the low carbon story than perhaps ahead of Copenhagen in 2009. Do you, do you sense that from a sort of an economics background? He said, you know, when you looked at those low carbon technologies, it was easier to sell that story. But um, how do you see that? Uh, I think it's easier for people to embrace that story. I'm not selling any stories. We're trying to analytically describe what's involved in the transition to the low carbon economy. I would agree with uh, Minister Greg. Barker on that. The technologies really have changed a lot. We know much more about energy efficiency, about uh, insulation, for example, and we have much better technologies to do it. We know much more about intelligent um, uh, uh, ways of doing that using uh, uh, ICT and so on. So people understand, I think, much more. They've seen solar panels uh, at work, they know they know what's involved. There is a cry in many countries for strengthening of public transport for all sorts of reasons, including energy efficiency and, and climate change. So I think in terms of people understanding what's involved in the transition, I think it's easier for people to do that. But we have to recognize that we're moving far too slowly. We are cutting emissions per unit of output as a world by less than 1% per annum, less than 1% per annum. We need to be cutting it by something like 5% per annum uh, every year for the rest of this century. So even though people are understanding better what's involved in the transition, recognizing that it's possible, recognizing that it's attractive, that process is far too slow. Um, a number of us are working on trying to deepen that understanding still further. That's what the Global Green Growth Institute um, a uh, multi-government uh, international organization based in Seoul, 20 countries members now. Um, that's what they do. That's what the uh, Calderon Commission, of which I'm vice chair on the new climate economy, is doing over this year and reporting in September 2014. And I could go on, but those are two very important activities around deepening the understanding of what the transition to the low carbon economy means, and in so doing, we hope accelerating that transition. What impact do you hope this Calderon Commission that you're involved in is going to have? Is it going to be um, as big, do you sense, as the, the, the report in 2006? What are, your, what are your goals and ambitions for that particular study? Well, I, I don't regard my report as the benchmark for uh, all impact. I think we have to have a broader view of life uh, than that. But I do hope that the Calderon Commission report on the new climate economy really will help change people's view on the attractiveness of the transition and what's involved. We have to do the work. I mean, we don't want to anticipate too early what the results will be, but we're looking at the transition to the uh, new climate economy because we think that there's a lot in there that is very attractive. But you have to show what's involved, the investments, the policies, managing the dislocation, because if you have a radical change in energy industrial revolution, it doesn't work unless there's some dislocation. Um, you have to radically reduce the use of hydrocarbons, unless, of course, you have um, abatement, carbon capture or utilization and uh, storage. 
So we have to look at the whole thing, we have to look at it very carefully. But my expectation is that uh, when we do that, the results will be pretty clear that uh, we do have to invest, but we can see how to do it. We do have to have uh, serious policies, including prices of carbon and energy efficiency and so on, but we can see how to do that. And when we pursue it, it's going to be cleaner, quieter, safer, more energy secure, more biodiverse, as well as fundamentally radically reducing the risks of climate change. When people see the details, see the examples, see where some countries and regions are going, then I think that argument is going to pick up uh, momentum and I hope in time for the, Gen the Secretary General of the United Nations meeting uh, in September, late September next year, of presidents and prime ministers on this issue so that we get a strong push from those people who have to take the decisions ahead of uh, the uh, COP21 in late 2015. There are people not far from here at the World Coal's Climate and Coal Summit saying it's economic madness to move away from coal. You're going to reduce thousands, millions of people in developing countries into um, greater poverty. Um, it's going to send many economies sliding back into even deeper recession. I mean, what's your, what's your sort of an answer to those guys who are sort of not, not far from here saying that um, coal is what's needed to drive this planet forward? My answer is that they're wrong. Um, if you uh, look at the potential of uh, other forms of energy, it's very strong. We've seen the price of uh, uh, solar, I'm mean, just to, to take one example, we've seen the price of solar panels drop by a factor of about five, divided by five, over the last six, seven, eight years. We're seeing the uh, cost of enzymes for uh, cellulosic ethanol come down by an even bigger factor in a similar kind of period. You're seeing very strong technical progress in those other industries. We'll probably see a very strong expansion of nuclear in China over the next 20 years, which is likely to bring down the cost of nuclear. And of course, and this is very important to the future of coal, carbon capture and storage. So if they're talking, I'm not, I haven't been at this uh, conference, I have to take your reports uh, uh, rather than my own uh, observation, but if they're, to, if they're looking very hard at carbon capture and storage for coal, then good luck to them. That is the future of coal. In terms of um, finance, which is always seems to be this sort of hot topic here, where, where do you see um, this process with, with generating enough finance? 100 billion a year by 2020 see, it still seems a long way off, especially when developed countries seem to be delivering around about the sort of 10 billion a mark per year at the moment. So where, where is that extra 90 or 80 billion going to come from? I think we should put that in perspective. What we're talking about is the world investing something uh, close on a trillion dollars a year um, around climate oriented investments. I mean, estimates vary, but uh, something pushing a trillion dollars a year. More than half of that would have to be in emerging markets and developing countries. That's where two thirds of investment is coming now in the world. It's very good that those emerging market and developing countries are growing and investing. So before we fixate on 100 billion, let's look at the overall investment challenge. And I said it's pushing a trillion dollars a year in the new, in, in, in climate oriented investments, with more than half of that in developing countries. Now, how's that going to get financed? Well, the big majority of that will be private sector finance. Whether it be in a village in India, where I've spent much of my life working, uh, and solar panels, and the small uh, farmer or villager investing in solar panels, or in much bigger uh, power stations or public transport systems, it's much of it is going to come from private sector investment. How's that going to happen? It's going to happen if the risk rewards uh, fit the bill. That means that government-induced policy risk, I mean, let me say that again because it's so important, that means that government-induced policy risk has to be reduced. The biggest deterrent 
to investment, not just in this area, but particularly in this area, is government-induced policy risk. Vacillation on policies. The idea that, okay, this, this policy this year, but tomorrow it might be completely different. That is a killer to investment. Governments have to recognize that the only serious long-term, indeed middle-term or short-term future, lies in the transition to the low-carbon economy. That is the growth story of the future. It is something that uh, will involve investment but looks attractive. If they set clear policy in place, that's the main answer to your question. That's where the finance will flow. But it depends on clarity and steadfastness in policy. It also depends on looking at sources of finance because things like green investment banks, uh, development banks, can themselves play a big role in reducing risk because if those banks are involved, that in itself will increase confidence in government policy, as well as structuring risk in a sensible way. So that's the first answer to your question. It's much bigger than $100 billion a year, and a big part of it is gonna come in uh, private sector investment, and I've described what we need to uh, release that private sector investment. That still leaves the question about the 100 billion. It does seem to me to be critical that uh, a big chunk of that is um, uh, public and public support. I think the more risky world, the more disruptive world, or disrupted world, as a result of climate change, means that support from rich countries to poor countries for the development process should rise. And that's where we ought to be focusing, and a big slice of that should be in climate-oriented investment because development, reducing emissions and adaptation are inextricably tied together. So we should see this as part of the intensified challenge associated with development and there's a duty uh, from rich countries because they're richer, because they've got technology, because they have the history of emissions. They have a duty to help in that process. So I do think a big chunk of that 100 billion should be uh, public support in the context of overall support for development in changed circumstances. Uh, the private sector, I've already emphasized, has a role to play uh, as well. But uh, we have to see it as uh, a bigger picture than the 100 billion. But we also have to see it as a duty of the rich countries to contribute strongly to that 100 billion in public finance. Uh, final question, what will, you, what will your message be um, next September to many of those countries that seem to be uh, downgrading their climate commitments. We've looked this week, we've seen Australia, Japan, Canada have said that they don't want to have anything to do with the carbon price. Even back in the UK, there are rumblings of discontent from certain members of the um, UK Conservative Party. How do you, how do you explain um, how some countries, some developed countries, given what you've just said, given the clear economic case, are pulling back from climate ambition? I think that pulling back from climate ambition is deeply irresponsible and a misunderstanding of where the world is going. I hope that all three of those countries will uh, change uh, and stop vacillating and move much more strongly in a sensible direction. So uh, what Australia, Canada and Japan are announcing is deeply disappointing and I hope they change back to a more sensible, responsible and attractive uh, path because each one of those three countries has so much to contribute in terms of technology, leadership, um, energy saving and energy efficiency and, and so on. Uh, the UK, I think you heard uh, what Prime Minister Cameron said just uh, a few days ago that uh, he's listened to the science, he recognises the importance and I trust that the UK will stick to the uh, carbon budgets that it's announced already um, well into the uh, 2020s with its fourth carbon budget. I trust that they'll stick to that, uh, show leadership, and in showing leadership, the UK will also gain great rewards from being more energy efficient, from being the frontier of uh, technology, and so on. There are some strange noises off uh, from the what we call the backwoodsmen in the uh, UK, but they're just strange noises off and we should understand that many of those are climate uh, deniers who have uh, declared war on the laws of physics 
and why would you want to give big weight to them? 